Hi everyone. In this video, we'll be talking about closed form solutions and induction. Specifically, we'll be learning a little bit about guessing closed form solutions for recurrence relations, and then verifying that those solutions are correct using a method called induction. So we begin by talking about the very first recurrence relation that we discussed at the beginning of the last video. So that's this P of N here. And well, when N is one, we get P of one equals one. For larger values of N, we take the previous value of P and add N. Now, in the course of uh, discussing this recurrence relation in the last video, we probably saw that P of N really is counting the sum of the first N numbers. So 1 plus 2 plus up through N minus 1 and then N. Now, if you compare the values of P of N that you get here to the values that you get from this formula here, you'll see that they appear to be the same. So let's try that, okay? So P of two, according to the recurrence relation, is two plus P of one. But P of one is one, so that's two plus one which is three. On the other hand, if I use this other more direct formula, I get two times two plus one over two, which is also equal to three. So this second formula, the direct formula, is what we call a closed form solution uh, to the recurrence relation that we started with. Now, there are advantages to both of these formulations. The closed form version here, the direct formula, is nice for computation because if I want to know P of 997, it's easy for me to plug in N equals 997 into this nice formula and get a number as an output. Whereas with the recurrence relation, if I want P of 997, I first have to know what P of 996 is, and so on and so forth. So that's a strong case for closed form solutions. On the other hand, recurrence relations at the outset of a problem are usually easier to come up with than closed form solutions. So let's imagine that in both of these problems, we want now to find the sum of the first n integers. Well, it's not immediately obvious that this should be the sum of the first n integers, but it does appear to be clear that this is the sum of the first n minus 1 integers, or excuse me, n minus 1 natural numbers, I mean to say, uh, plus the nth, right? So if I want a formula for this sum, the recurrence relation is more natural at the outset than the closed form solution. Okay, we might also remember the example we had on the previous video about Ursula the usurer who was charging 10% interest compounded weekly on a $500 loan. And this MN is telling us how much we owe after N weeks. So if we just evaluate some of these values of M, we see from the pattern here, it looks like MN is given by this simple formula 500 times 1.10 to the nth power. So again, that's easy to compute. However, it might not be the first formula we come up with when we're considering the problem at the outset. The recurrence formulation here might rather be the first thing that we come up with. Okay, next I want you to recall this recurrence relation HN. 
Now this, remember from the prior video, is counting uh, the hexagonal numbers, right? That's the number of, of circles that are needed to form a solid hexagon with n circles on a side. So, you know, if we want to find a closed form solution to this recurrence relation, it turns out that what we do is consider what are called successive differences. So what we do is first list off some of the values of H from the recurrence relation. So remember, H of 1 is 1, H of 2 is uh, 7, H of 3 was 19. So we start listing those off. And then what we do is we just take successive differences. So we take 7 minus 1 to get 6. We take 19 minus 7 to get 12, 37 minus 19 to get 18, and so on and so forth. And then we take that list of numbers and compute successive differences for them. And what we notice is that all of those differences are equal to 6. So what we did is we had two iterations of successive differences before we got down to constant differences. So that number two is important because for reasons that we're not explaining here, that indicates that the closed form solution for this H of N has a polynomial form where the polynomial is of degree two. So the two there comes from the number of successive differences that we need to get down to constant differences. Now, in order to find our closed form uh, solution, we need to know what the coefficients a, b, and c are. So to find those coefficients a, b, and c for h of n, for the closed form solution for h of n, uh, it turns out that we need to solve a system of equations. Right, so remember that our proposed closed form solution um, looks sort of like this. It's a n squared plus b n plus c. Now when n equals 1, if you imagine plugging in n equals 1, you get a plus b plus c, which is on the right side of this equation. However, h of 1, you'll remember, is equal to 1. So since we want f of 1 and h of 1 to be equal, we put 1 equal to a plus b plus c. And then remember that h of 2 was 7. And f of 2 up here... When you let n be 2, you get 4a plus 2b plus c. So we want those to be equal. And then h of 3 is 19. And f of 3 is 9a plus 3b plus c. So now we have three equations in three, the three unknowns a, b, and c. And that allows us to solve for a, b, and c uniquely. It turns out that a is equal to 3, b is equal to minus 3, and c is equal to 1. So now those numbers, when we plug them in here, give this uh, supposed closed form solution. So that is our guess for uh, the closed form solution for h of n. Okay, now guessing is not enough because it's possible to be wrong. And so we need some method for verifying that our guess is the correct guess. So here's the scenario, right? We have a recurrence relation r of n and we have a hypothesized closed form solution. And what we want to do is show that r of n and f of n are identical, not for just for n equals 1 or n equals 2 or n equals 3. We want, it, we want that for all possible values of n. And so what we do is we prove this using a method called induction. 
So induction involves essentially two steps. The first step is what's called the base case. So we need to show for the very first value of n, namely n equals 1, that um, r of n and f of n are equal. So the first step is to verify that r of 1 is equal to f of 1. Then what we do is we imagine a value k bigger than 1. And we imagine a world where r of k minus 1 is equal to f of k minus 1. And then we use that supposition to show that r of k minus 1 equaling f of k minus 1 implies r of k equals f of k. So why does proof by induction work? Well, let's suppose we have the two items of induction in place. That is, let's suppose we know that f of 1 is r of 1 and that r of k minus 1 equaling f of k minus 1 implies r of k equaling f of k. So let's suppose that we have these two items in place. Then why should uh, r or f of n be equal to r of n for all n? So the answer to why that happens, it boils down to modus ponens, believe it or not. Okay, remember this modus ponens from our section on logic. Okay, suppose I want to know that uh, f of 2 is r of 2. Well, I already know from my base case that f of 1 is equal to r of 1. And I know from my induction step that uh, f of 1 equaling r of 1 implies f of 2 equals r of 2. So I have these two things in place. Then modus ponens tells me that f of 2 is equal to r of 2. Okay, so from the base case and from the induction step, I'm able to apply modus ponens to get the next equation, f of 2 equals r of 2. Now, how do you get f of 3 equals r of 3? Well, you use modus ponens again, right? Except you start with your givens as being f of 2 equaling r of 2, and f of 2 equaling r of 2 implies f of 3 equals r of 3. And then you're able to conclude using modus ponens that f of 3 equals r of 3. And so you can think about this sort of like a set of dominoes falling, right? You've got this long list of di dominoes, and you th can think of each domino is representing the equation like f of n equals r of n. So your first domino is f of 1 equals r of 1. Your second domino is f of 2 equals r of 2. And so if you can knock down the first domino and each falling domino will uh, knock down the next domino, then you know ultimately that every single domino is being knocked down. And that's the idea of proof by induction. So let's use induction to prove that this recurrence relation, which remember counts the hexagonal numbers, has this closed form solution. So you might recall that we guessed this as a closed form solution a couple of slides ago. And now we're going to show that it actually works, not just for n equals 1 and n equals 2, but for all values of n bigger than or equal to 1. So remember that proof by induction starts with the base case. 
So that's step one. That is, we want to show that f of one and h of one are identical. So the recurrence relation tells us that h of one is equal to one. Meanwhile, when we plug uh, one into uh, f of n, remember here that f of n equals 3n squared minus 3n plus 1. Right, when we plug in 1 to f, we again get 1. So f of 1 and h of 1 are identical. So that's our first step, base case, and it's been taken care of. Now what we're going to do is suppose for some value of k bigger than 1 that um, h of k minus 1 is equal to f of k minus 1. And what we want to do is show that in that, in the case that that holds, that that will imply that h of k equals f of k. So remember, f of k minus 1 is what we get by plugging k minus 1 into our formula here for n. So we wind up with this. So we're going to assume this is true, and we're going to want to show that h of k is equal to f of k. So we start with h of k. Here it is. And we're told, according to the recurrence relation, that this is h of k minus 1 plus 6k minus 6. But now we can use our induction hypothesis, right? Remember, we're imagining a world where h of k minus 1 is f of k minus 1. So I take h of k minus 1 and replace it with f of k minus 1, which is right there. And then we still have our 6k and our minus 6. And now we've got this gigantic expression involving k's, which we can simplify. And upon simplification, we wind up with this, and we notice that that is exactly f of k. So the two main points of induction are in place, and therefore, by induction, the process of induction, we can conclude that h of n and f of n are equal for all values of n bigger than or equal to 1. Okay, well, here's another example. So you might remember on the uh, previous video, we were discussing this relation, recurrence relation, c of n. And c of n, remember, was counting or computing the size of the power set Uh, of the set consisting of n elements. So you take a set of size n, you take its power set, and you count how many things are in that power set. And that's what c of n is. Okay, so you might remember that we came up with this recursive formula for c of n. And at the time, I pointed out for you that it looked like these c of n's were just powers of 2. And now what we're going to do is use proof by induction to verify that. Okay, so remember our induction process involves two steps. There's a base case, and then there's an induction step. So the base case in, in, in this example involves n equals 0, right? So that's the very first value of n in this example. And remember, our goal is to show ultimately that c of n is equal to uh, f of n uh, for all n, bigger than or equal to 0, where f of n is this just power of 2 function, and c of n is the recursion, recurrence relation that we had on the previous slide. Okay, so the base case again involves n equals 0. That's our very first value of n. If you go back and you look at the recurrence relation, it tells us that c of 0 is equal to 1. Meanwhile, f of 0 is 2 to the 0, which is also equal to 1. And so c and f agree uh, when n is equal to 0. 
So now we imagine k being some number bigger than zero, and we also imagine that uh, c of k minus one and f of k minus one are equal here. So our goal then in the induction step is to show that under this hypothesis, it follows that c of k will equal to f, uh, f of k. Okay, so we start with c of k. The recurrence relation tells us that this is 2 times c of k minus 1. But remember, by the induction hypothesis, c of k minus 1 is f of k minus 1, namely 2 to the k minus 1. So I can take my c of k minus 1 and replace it by 2 to the k minus 1. And then 2 times 2 to the k minus 1 is just 2 to the k, right? But that's f of k. So we've shown that c of k minus 1 equaling f of k minus 1 implies c of k has to equal f of k. And then that's the end of our uh, induction proof. And so we're able to then conclude that c of n equals 2 to the n for all n bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, on this slide, the point is that not all good guesses are correct guesses. So for instance, let's suppose we have this recurrence relation P of n, and we have a proposed closed form solution right here. So does P of n equal n plus 2 times 2 to the n minus 1 for all n bigger than or equal to 0? Uh, well, it turns out that for many values of n, over the first several values of n, it works perfectly well. Uh, unfortunately, though, it fails uh, ultimately. Right, so when n is equal to 4, for instance, uh, you know, p of 4 is 51, but the closed form solution gives you 48. Right, so just knowing the first few values agree is not enough. Right, that's why the induction proof is an important idea. It allows us to prove that our guess is more than just an incorrect guess that it really does work for all values of n.